Hello and welcome back to Planet 40k. We've got another video for you. We're going to be doing the advanced tactics for the Ophidian Destroyers. So before getting into all the data sheet and all the tactics and all that kind of stuff, I've got a little bit of a bone to pick with the Ophidian Destroyers. I think they're quite underwhelming, especially with the new chapter approved book that came out this year. I think they're struggling, but we'll see why throughout this video. Also guys, just a note to you all, I've stripped back on all the visuals. It was taking far too long in terms of the editing with all the visuals that we were doing in the previous couple of videos. So I just wanted to try a more stripped back approach in this video just to see how it fares, see how it works with time and whatnot. So I want to be doing more frequent videos as opposed to doing one a week. So hopefully we're going to be doing more, two, three, maybe even four per week if this goes according to plan. So let's get straight into the data sheet. The Ophidian Destroyers, they're of course the fast attack selection. And they're coming in at 4 power level or 30 points per model. And they've got to take at least 3 of them for a min unit and they can go right the way up to 6 models for the unit of Ophidian Destroyers. So before we start to talk about the advanced tactics for the video, let's break down the data sheet. So they've got a very nifty movement of 10 inches, weapon skill and blitz skill value of a 3+, strength and toughness 4, wounds 3, attacks 3, leadership 10 and a 4 plus armor save. So the toughness doesn't quite match the other destroyer units within our Necron Codex. They've only got toughness of 4, which kind of lets them down slightly. Also, their armor save is only a 4+, plus as opposed to a 3+. plus. So they're kind of squishy, but we'll get onto that kind of stuff. So before getting into the abilities, we need to quickly mention their key words. So they are an infantry unit, so that's going to interact with secondary objectives, for example, the ones that apply to only infantry models. So it's going to help with that. They're a core unit now. So since the balance update that happened at the end of last year, They've got the core keywords, so they're going to interact with all sorts of shenanigans now. You've got Veil of Darkness Relics if you wanted to do that. You've got the My Will Be Done ability if you wanted to do that. There's lots more flexibility with your codex because they've got the core keyword. And finally, they're a Destroyer Cult unit, so that's going to interact with some of the characters within the codex. In particular, the Scorpec Lord and the Locust Lord. They're the two that are going to give the United in Destruction ability. We'll talk about that later in the video. But something that they don't lack is the abilities. They've got plenty of abilities. Of course, they've got the standard stuff. They've got the Living Metal ability because they're a multi-wound model. So they're regaining a lost wound at the start of each of your turns in the command phase. They've got the reanimation protocols, which means you could be potentially bringing models back. Now, it doesn't work as well with their multi-wound models because they've got three wounds. You need to roll three five-plus rolls or a four-plus roll if you're using some other shenanigans, whether it's a resurrection orb as an example. But you need to roll for all of those wounds for a model to come back. You can't just bring half a model back. So it does become quite tricky, especially when you've got a min unit of three of them, because you're only likely going to be losing one or maybe two of them in a given phase. And that leaves you with only three or six dice to get that five plus roll with. They've of course got the command protocols if they're within six inches of a character model and you've got a noble on the table. So you've got the option of using the command protocols there. We will talk about those as well later in the video in the synergy section. So they've got some more unique abilities, partly due to them being a destroyer cult unit. So the first one being Hardwired for Destruction, so they simply get to reroll all hit rolls of a 1. So that's going to be their melee attacks because they're a melee based unit, they don't do any shooting. So all your hit rolls of a 1, you're going to be getting to reroll those. So furthermore, if you roll a 6 to hit with the Reap Blades, you're going to get an additional hit with those weapons. So that's the Hyperphase Reap Blades, that's the only weapon you can use with that. This isn't going to work with the Hyperphase Threshers, it's just the Hyperphase Reap Blades. They've then got the Whip Coiled Bodies, so it's a minus 1 to hit them in melee which is going to give them a little bit more resiliency. Now, they're still toughness 4 and they've got an armor save of 4+, plus, but it's giving them something at least. Then the final ability they've got is the Tunneling Horrors ability. So in the reinforcement step of your movement phase, these guys can tunnel in, which will be from turn 2 onwards. You can't do it in turn 1. So turn 2 onwards, you can come in anywhere on the board, but it's got to be more than 9 inches away from enemy models. So this is going to be good for a number of reasons. You've got your secondary objectives. You can be using them as more of an offensive unit, getting towards, say, a vehicle in the back lines of your enemy's deployment zone. Things like that. It's going to have a lot of uses. So let's get onto the war gear for the Ophidian Destroyers. What are they carrying? So for a min unit of three, one of the models within that unit is going to be carrying a Reap Blade. Now this is strength plus two, making it strength six, minus four AP, and the damage is a flat three. So if these guys are getting into a fight, they're going to be slicing and dicing things pretty comfortably. Now the other two models within the unit are coming with the Hyperphase Threshers. Now this is only strength 4 because it's strength user. It's minus 3 AP and it's a flat 2 damage. So it's still pretty decent killing like infantry models such as Space Marines for example. That's always the go-to when you're comparing other codexes. But with this weapon you're getting an additional attack. And then furthermore the Ophidian Destroyers have the Ophidian Claws. Now these are also an additional weapon to what they're going to be having whether it's the Reap Blades or whether it's the Hyperphase Threshers. They get two attacks with these. And it's strength user, which is strength 4, minus 1 AP and 1 damage. So all in all, with a min unit of 3 of these guys, you can expect 17 attacks from the unit. 
ranging from strength 4 right up into strength 6, and that damage of course ranging from damage 1 to damage 3. So it's quite a lot of attacks, quite a lot of damage, you just got to get them in really. So let's talk about the in-game uses. Now, I've got two uses for them within a game, but both of them are kind of geared towards tunneling them in from turn 2 onwards. So the first one is secondary objectives. We are going to speak about the secondary objectives in more detail in that section of this video, but that's one of the reasons you're going to be bringing them up. You're going to get them onto an objective or into enemy backlines. You're going to be scoring some secondary points with them because it's one of the few units within our codex that can actually deep strike. Then the other role for them, in my opinion, is to just be simply an offensive unit. Now you've got the Scorpit Destroyers as another alternative to the Ophidian Destroyers, but they can't do the deep strike ability with that tunneling horrors. They've got to go on foot, or they could use the Veil of Darkness Relic, I guess, as their core unit. But your Ophidian Destroyers are an alternative option, and they're a fast attack option. They're not an elite unit. So if you've got too many elite models within your list, so you've got all the Catan Charge, your Lich Guard, for example, you can head into the fast attack slots, get your Ophidian Destroyers. They're still going to chop things up if they can get into a fight. So let's talk about some stratagems that are going to relate to your Ophidian Destroyers. And I've got two that I'm going to highlight today in this video. The first one being Burrowing Nightmares. So for only one command point, you can literally take an Ophidian Destroyer unit that's on the battlefield, remove them from the battlefield. Then in the next reinforcement step, so that's your next turn, your next movement phase, you can bring them back on as if they were retunneling more than nine inches away from enemy models. So this is good for a few reasons. Maybe they've come in turn two, made the nine inch charge, they've sliced and diced their way through a unit, then they're just kind of out the game, maybe they're in a corner of the battlefield, and all the rest of the game is on the other side. So you want to kind of get them into a better position, and you don't want to spend two or three turns moving them across the board. So you can just pop this stratagem, then yes, you are losing a turn with them, but you're also protecting them. So you're getting them off the board, they can't be shot at, they can't be targeted, you're bringing them back in, with only a nine inch charge, they can go and do some more damage. And the second option is the Disruption Fields. It's only one command point again, and because they've now got the core keyword, they can plus one to their strength in melee. So all of a sudden your Hyperphase Reap Blades are now strength seven, so now they're gonna be able to attack those vehicles at a toughness seven, and also the Hyperphase Threshers are now strength five, as opposed to strength four. So now they're gonna be slicing through Space Marines, for example, with toughness four. They're only needing threes to wound. Then also don't forget there's the Ophidian Claws. They're gonna get a plus one to their strength, so they'll be strength five as well. So that's the two stratagems covered, let's move on to the Dynasty Codes. So from the six generic codes within the Necron Codex, I wanted to highlight three of them today, the first one being the Novak Dynasty. So for obvious reasons, you're going to be picking a Novak Dynasty for these guys because they get a plus one to their charge roll. So if these guys are tunneling in, they're going to need that nine inch charge to get into engagement range, but this now becomes an eight inch charge because you get that plus one to the charge roll. Then furthermore, in the first round of the fight, you're going to get an extra bit of AP. Now you don't really need it with your Reap Blades, they've already got a minus 4 AP. The Hyperphase Freshers were minus 3, so they go up to minus 4 AP. And even the Ophidian Claws now go to minus 2 AP. So that's pretty decent. Now to further add to this, they've got their Stratagem Blood Rites, which is simply an additional attack for every model in the unit. So now all of a sudden, a min unit of these guys is having 20 attacks as opposed to 17. And with some of them having Strength 6 or potentially Strength 7 with the Disruption Field Stratagem, there's going to be plenty more attacks here. The second option I wanted to highlight today is the Zerican Dynasty. So they've got the 5 plus feel no pain save against mortal wounds, which is going to help them somewhat, but they've also got the ability to re-roll a single wound roll per phase, which definitely comes in handy throughout the game. They've then got their stratagem, which is Empiric Damping. So for a single command point, if the enemy psychers within 18 inches of your Ophidian Destroyers, as an example, they get to deny that psychic ability on a roll of a 4 plus. Now we don't have that many denies within our codex because we're not a psychic codex, we don't have any psychers. There is a few ways of doing it and this is one of them. While we're talking about the Zarakan Dynasty, I just want to bring up the Silent King. Of course the Silent King has got loads of buffs to core units with their hit rolls, with their wound rolls. So this is going to definitely be a bit of synergy if you're taking this Dynasty code and you're taking the Silent King. Then the third one I've got to talk about today is the Nehelak Dynasty. So this will give them objective secured, even though they're a fast attack and not a troop. Objective secured, especially on a unit that's tunneling in, making that 9 inch charge. All of a sudden, you're still in objectives while you're in a fight. So that's going to really aid not only your primaries and or denying primaries for your opponent, but also it could be for your secondary objectives as well. Now unfortunately, the Nihilak stratagem isn't going to benefit the Yifidin destroyers whatsoever. We should reclaim a lost empire. It works in infantry units, but it works on the range attacks of an infantry unit, and they don't have any range attacks. So unfortunately, the stratagem's no good, but the objective secured, I think, is massive. 
Then you've got to look at the dynastic traditions from the custom codes. The first one being Eternal Conquerors, of course. Like we just mentioned within the Hayak Dynasty, getting objectives secured is pretty big. You then got Butchers, which is very similar to the Novak code. Getting that plus one to the charge roll could be very handy, especially tunneling in. You'll definitely want that. And the third one I wanted to mention from the dynastic traditions list is Rad Reeved. So Rad Reeved is an aura that affects non-vehicle enemy units. So if they're within one inch of your Ophidian Destroyers, it's a minus one to their toughness. Now this is pretty big, especially for Ophidian Destroyers, and here's why. So for example, if you're going up against Toughness 4, again I'm going to use Space Marines, it's a real easy example to go with. You're going up against some Toughness 4 models, Rad Reeved is going to give them a minus one to their toughness, so now they've got Toughness 3, so all your Strength 4 weaponry is going to be wounded on 3s. So that's going to be your Hyperface Threshers and your Ophidian Claws. Then furthermore, don't forget your Reap Blades, which are Strength 6, which is now going to be wounded on 2s, because again, they're Toughness 3 against your Strength 6, so you only need 2s to wound as opposed to 3s. And even if you're going against Toughness 3 kind of models with, say, Eldari or Drukari, for example, that's also going to mean your Strength 4 weapons are going to wound on 2s as well, because Strength 4 is now going against Toughness 2, not Toughness 3. Then from the circumstances of the Awakening list, there's two that I wanted to highlight, the first one being the Rise of the Interlopers. So any melee attacks from your bikers or your infantry units that hit with the 6 will automatically wound the target. So you're not even going to need to roll your wound rolls because you're automatically wounding if you hit on 6s. And again, with 17 attacks, you can expect two or three of those to be sixes. And don't forget you're re-rolling the ones as well. Now, most of the time, I want to talk about the Relentlessly Expansionist option. But for these guys tunneling in, you don't really need that six-inch pre-game movement. You want to be tunneling in nine inches away from enemy models. So that one isn't really an option. It's not a go-to for Ophidian Destroyers. So let's talk unit size. There's only really two options in terms of the unit size. You're either going with a minion of three of them. They're going to be coming in from the tunnels, or you're going to be taking a max unit of six of them. Now, the reason why you take a max unit of six of them, because for every three models, one of them is going to have the Reap Blade, which is the strength six weapon. So if you only go taking five models as opposed to six, you're not going to have access to that second Reap Blade within the units. Now, they will be liable to the Blast keyword for enemy weapons, but it's up to you if you want to be liable to Blast or get an additional strength six weapon within your units. I personally want the extra Reap Blade. Also, another quick chapter we're going to talk about, which is the deployment. Now, there's only one real way, in my opinion, to deploy these guys, and you're putting them into reinforcements, and they're going to be tunneling in turn two, turn three, turn four, whatever turn you want them in. They're going to be doing their secondaries, or they're going to be going on the offense, making that charge, getting into a fight, slicing things down, and then going from there. If you're not coming in from deep strike, then just go for the Scorbit Destroyers, in my opinion. They're much better, they've got a better toughness, they've got a better armor save, they've got better weapons. So, yeah, if you're not deep striking them, you go for the Scorpet Destroyers. Now, before moving on with the video, I just wanted to get our sponsor in here. It's an Etsy store called the Sigmarite Boutique. So currently they're doing customized wound trackers. You go onto their store on their Etsy website. And for $18.95, you can get a pack of 10 of these and they're customized. So you basically choose your own color. So as you can see from the screen, I've already got mine customized to say Planet 40k. And they're in the gold and blue scheme that I'm currently doing. And yes, I am starting to paint, believe it or not. I've got some scarabs there already. Gold and blue. But you can do any colour you want. So if you want your own customised logo, just email him, ask him. He's probably going to be able to do it. Of course, it does depend on how simple or how difficult it is. But just let him know. And for £18.95, that's in British pounds, you can get a pack of 10 of these. I believe that's 25 Canadian dollars. And it's about $19 to $20 from the US. Now, he does ship worldwide. So get onto his Etsy store. The link will be down in the description below. That's the Sigmarite Boutique. Link down below. Okay, so we're on to the synergy now. So the first piece of synergy comes from both the Locust Lord and the Scorpet Lord. Both of them, as we already mentioned in the intro, they've got the United in Destruction aura ability. So destroy occult units that are within six inches of these character models get to re-roll wound rolls of a one. So they're already re-rolling hit rolls of a one because of their hardwired for destruction ability. And now they'll be able to re-roll wound rolls of a one if they're within close proximity of the Locust Lord or the Scorpet Lord. Now, the second bit of synergy is from the Catacomb Command Barge. Now, the reason I'm mentioning the Barge and not a standard Overlord model is because the Catacomb Command Barge has got the speed to keep up with your Ophidian Destroyers. And why you want to be using the Catacomb Command Barge is because of the My Will Be Done ability. So this works on core units within 9 inches. They get to simply plus 1 to their hit rolls. So now, all of a sudden, they're going to be hitting on 2s and re-rolling 1s in melee. Then furthermore, to boost your Ophidian Destroyers using the Catacomb Command Barge, he can take the Veil of Darkness Relic, so he can meet your Ophidian Destroyers 
in a location once they've done their tunneling in, then once they've removed a unit they can Veil of Darkness into another location of the board within the next movement phase. Now further synergy would be to use a Technomancer. Now he's got the rights of reanimation ability so we can be bringing a single model back every single turn in your command phase because they're a core unit. But you probably need to take the Canoptic Cloak with your Technomancer to give him that 10 inch movement and the fly keyword. Now he doesn't really need the fly keyword to be honest, but the 10 inch movement is quite crucial to be able to keep up with the 10 inch movement of the Ophidian Destroyers. And then to further boost that Technomancer you can give him the Crypto Arcana which is the Dimensional Sanctum which will effectively give him Deep Strike so he can be coming in with your Ophidian Destroyers from your reinforcements so that they're all going to be together without having to actually meet them in a certain location. What else we got? So we got the Chronomancer as well. So if you're using the Chronomancer, very similar to the Technomancer, he can use a Dimensional Sanctum to meet you guys there. But of course he's got the Chronometron ability. So he's going to give a 5 plus invulnerable save to your Ophidian Destroyers, which don't actually have an invun save. And then furthermore, he's going to be able to give them that reroll to their charge roll. Now you've got to mention here that this happened in the command phase. So you're not going to be able to use the Chronometron ability on the same turn that you've deep struck your guys in. Because of course you've missed the command phase, they're going to be off the field. But once they come in and then it's turn 3, turn 4 onwards, they're all on the battlefield. You can put the Chronometron ability on them, give them the inbun save, re-roll the charge roll. Not too bad. And then we get onto the command protocols, which as you know, I don't like using too much. But we're going to mention them. There's one particular, which is the protocol of Hungry Void, which is the melee based kind of command protocol. Now Directive 1 just adds AP to the weapons, which is only really useful for the Hyperphase Threshers and the Ophidian Claws. Because the Reap Blades are already minus 4 AP, they probably don't need it. But the more important one here is Directive 2, getting an extra bit of strength in the first round of the combat. So you can actually pair this with the stratagem that we mentioned earlier, which is the Disruption Fields, giving them a plus 1 to their strength. So now all of a sudden those Reap Blades that were strength 6 will now be strength 8. So even those Toughness 4 models you're now wounding them on 2s, and even Toughness 7 vehicles you're wounding them on 3s. Then of course all your strength 4 weapons are going to go to strength 6 as well. So that's going to be really good going against Toughness 5 because you're now wounding them on 3s. And even Toughness 3 you're now wounding them on 2. So secondary objectives. This is where we get a little bit more advanced with the video. What kind of secondary objectives should the Ophidian Destroyers be dealing with? So from the Purge the Enemy section there's not really that much for us as a Necron player to use. But there is Assassination and the reason I'm mentioning Assassination is because you can go hunting characters. You can come in anywhere on the board with that Tunneling Horrors ability 9 inches away from hopefully a character model. Now the character models are very likely going to be guarded with some sort of screen but hopefully you can kind of multi-charge them in taking out the character as well as the screen or just taking out the screen with your shooting attacks and then go for the charge against that specific character. And if you can do this multiple times in a game you can max out on assassination. From the No Mercy No Respite list you've got Grind Them Down. Again they're going to be tunneling in, making that charge move, taking out a unit and if you can simply destroy more units than your opponent does to you you're going to be scoring points every battle round. Now this isn't really handmade for the Ophidian Destroyers, but it is an option for you if you want to take Grind It Down, and if it relates to the rest of your army. As far as the Shadow Operation secondaries go, there's a couple here. You've got the new rod, which is Retrieve Knockman Data. Now you will probably need to do this with a max unit of 6 Ophidian Destroyers as opposed to 3, because in this new chapter approved you've got to roll for it. So if you roll equal to or more than the amount of models that you've got in your unit, you're going to fail that action. So the more models within the unit, the easier it will be to do the action. So for example, if you've got three models in the unit and you roll a five, you're going to fail. Whereas if you've got six models in the unit and you roll a five, you're going to pass. So the larger the unit, the better. This one's probably better done with flayed ones because you can get more in a unit and they're a lot cheaper as well. But if you take a max unit of these guys, you can do it. Then another one from that list is Deploy Teleport Homers. Now because they've got that deep strike ability, or the tunneling in ability rather, they can be coming in, doing the action at the end of the movement phase, so straight away pretty much. And you can either be scoring 2 points if you're 12 inches away from the enemy deployment, or 4 points if you're within the enemy deployment, which you can be if they've not screened it well enough. Now there is a slight problem with this one, is the fact that they're not a troop selection, they're a fast attack. So they have to survive an entire round, and then it has to come back to your command phase before you can actually score the points. So they're definitely going to have a target on their back as soon as they arrive because your opponent is not going to want you scoring, especially if you're in their deployment zone, maximising the points. But the best options, in my opinion, come from the Battlefield Supremacy list. So you've got Behind Enemy Lines, again for the same reason they're going to be tunnelling in, and if you've got two of these units doing that, you're going to be scoring four points every battle round. If you've got one unit, you're still going to be scoring two. But there's no actions that you need to do, you don't need to wait an entire turn in order to get the points, you score it on your own turn, so that's a very good option in my opinion. 
The second option, engage on all fronts, is kind of similar in a way. You've got to have all the quarters. So of course they're not going to be able to do this alone because it requires at least two other units to score and engage on all fronts. But they're going to be a part of that scoring system. Whether you're getting two points per round or three points per round, depending on how many quarters you've got, they can be a part of that. Then the final one is Stranglehold. Especially if you're playing the Nihilak Dynasty, you're taking objectives quite easily. And if you've got more objectives than your opponent does, and you've got at least three of them, you're going to be getting three points per battle round. So why this is good for Ophidian Destroyers, they're going to be coming in through the tunnels, getting onto an objective, hopefully making a charge move onto the objective, that makes it even easier. So not only are you gaining an objective, but your opponent is losing an objective as well. So that's going to definitely benefit in terms of the numbers, you need to have more than your opponent does. But hopefully by that point you'll have three objectives, you should have already at least two that are probably near your own deployment zone anyway. So this will be the third or even the fourth that you've got hold of. So we're on to the comparison section of the video. There's a couple of units that I wanted to compare the Ophidian Destroyers to. Now the first one is the Scorpit Destroyers of course. Both of them are very similar, they're both Destroyer Cult units. And they're both 30 points as well, but here are the main differences. The first is the movement. The Ophidian Destroyers are slightly quicker, not by much, it's only 2 inches, but you've got to give them the point for that. They've only got a strength 4 and they've only got a toughness 4, whereas the Scorbit Destroyers have strength and toughness of a 5. So that's pretty big, especially when their weapons are like plus 2 for example. And then furthermore the armor save is much better, they've got a 3 plus armor save, that's with the Scorbit Destroyers, as opposed to a 4 plus with the Ophidian Destroyers. So they're much more resilient, especially with the toughness 5 as already mentioned. But you then got to bring it back, the Ophidian Destroyers have got the whipcore body, so it's a minus 1 to hit them in melee and they're able to deep strike naturally, you don't need to use some sort of Nephric Dynasty stratagem or a Veil of Darkness Relic to get them into a certain location. But I personally think the Scorpit Destroyers are a better option, especially when you're going slicing and dicing with these kind of units. Now if you weren't going slicing and dicing and you wanted to use them for a scoring kind of unit for your secondary objectives, maybe your primaries as well, then you've got to compare them to the flayed ones. So the Amphidian Destroyers, a min unit of three of them is costing you 90 points, and that's going to get you three Destroyers, or 9 wounds if you like. So if you're going to spend those 90 points on the flayed ones instead, you're getting the same amount of wounds, you're still getting 9 wounds, but you're getting 9 individual models. But that's important because of enemy weapons in terms of the damage. So for example, if they've got a damage 3 weapon, and they fire it at a flayed one, only one flayed one will be removed, and that's only one wound gone. Whereas if they fire it at an Ophidian Destroyer, that's going to be all 3 wounds for the Ophidian Destroyer gone, so your Ophidian Destroyer unit will lose 30 points, whereas your flayed one unit will only lose 10. Then it kind of goes back to the secondaries that we mentioned earlier with the Retrieve Nutman Data. It's going to work much better with flayed ones because you can have bigger units. You can have up to 20 of them in fact. So when you're rolling to do that Retrieve Nutman Data, if you've got a unit of 5 of them, you can only fail it on a 6. Whereas if you've got a unit of 3 Ophidian Destroyers, you can fail it on a 4, a 5 or a 6. So you're less likely going to be achieving it with the Ophidian Destroyers. So in terms of a more offensive unit, I think the Scorbit Destroyers are better. And in terms of a scoring unit, I think the Flayed ones are better. So they kind of can do both. But if you're planning the list out pre-game, you want to know what their role is within the game. You don't want to be giving them both jobs, if you like. You want to be giving them the one job, and they need to focus on that one job. Okay, so let's get on to our community reviews on our Discord. So as you know by now, we take some little snippets off of our Discord. They give a little review of the unit we're currently covering, and they'll give a score out of 10. So the first one is Mara 998 He's put 5 out of 10. If you can make their charge move, they do a lot of damage, but very much a glass cannon, and making a 9-inch charge is unreliable. 6 out of 10 if it's the Novak Code, due to the 8-inch charge being more attainable. Fast attack slots have much better units though, Scarabs and Wraiths, and Scorbit Destroyers cost the same and are generally better. So he's given a 5 out of 10, or a 6 out of 10 with the Novak Code. Then the second one I'm going to bring in today, which is Mr. Reality. So he's put great little glass cannon that can be used to threaten some of the bigger bads. Toughness 4 is a bit of an issue, but then minus 1 to hit helps out a bit there. Great fun in narrative games, but meh in competitive. 7 out of 10 for mostly narrative players. So that's their opinions there, so shout out to those two guys from our Discord. And if you haven't already joined our Discord, the link is below. It is free to join. Now there is a VIP members area for the paid members. But there is also free areas of the Discord where you can talk about painting, you can talk about tactics, you can talk about list build, and of course you can put your unit reviews in which may make the next video. Okay, so let's get on to my final thoughts. 
So they kind of stuck between a killer unit and a point scoring unit for your secondaries. They've got the versatility to do both, but flayed ones are better at one and scorpion destroyers are better at the other. And if you already know what you're going to be doing with these guys, then you should be selecting one of those other units as we just mentioned. The only advantage they've really got is the 10 inch speed. Do they really need it when they're tunneling in anyway? They only need to get that 9 inch charge off. Okay, maybe when they go to the second target, that 10 inch will be quite handy. But the scorpion destroyers aren't that far behind with an 8 inch movement. It's a real shame that the toughness 4 as well as a 4 plus armor save, I think at least one of them should be boosted in my opinion. I'd probably give them a toughness 5 just simply because they're a destroyer cult unit. They should have toughness 5 on all the destroyer cult units. That would make them a little bit better in terms of their resiliency. But for me overall they're just a bit underwhelming. When you've got the flayed ones and the scorpion destroyers at your disposal, why would you pick a Fidian destroyers? They're not really for me, so today they're going to be getting the average stamp. So guys that's what I think, you'll have to let me know what you think below. And before you leave, remember to like and subscribe to the channel. So guys, all that's left to really say is thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.